Hunt, your player for Live Talk. Good to be with you. Damn, it's great to have you. We've not we've done a live show that wasn't from my phone. <laughs> That's right? right. Yeah, the early days of like propping the phone up in your living room. I know. It's like, hey guys, I'm Z Dog. We're like, it's uncomfortably close. Yeah, just share a mic. People realize that you're just me with a wig. <laughs> like it's it's a whole it's a whole process. Let's um let's see where the Z Pack's at here. I'm gonna get their comments. We're gonna take comments on COVID, on the origins of COVID, on is the pandemic over? Dr. McCary, of course, the Johns Hopkins surgeon, public health guy, business guy, like has appointments in all the departments and also a brother from another mother. Gotta be with you. That's a thing. All right, so let's see. Erica Amity says, see, so glad you were at the right desk. See, I had to switch desks the other day. Ah. It. it threw my supporters for a loop. It was like bizarro. Z. That's the, the throne that you're on. Right this now. is the throne, which means it's also a toilet. It's all built in. I am, I am a pawn at my throne. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> that sounds vaguely biblical, Marty McCary. Uh, let me ask. Uh, from the Torah. The Torah. <laughs> I believe it's pronounced Torah. Torah. Both. Yeah, Torah. both. It's both. So you're, um, you're on the media all the time, my man. What's it like being a media doctor? Because, you know, I get yelled at for being an internet doctor. So, Well, when you, when you do media... Immediately, 45% of the U.S. population hates your guts before you say anything. <laughs> but the reason to go on is if you feel that there is something that needs to be said that is not currently being said. Right. And so, you know, there's been a lot of missteps during the pandemic. And so those are things that, you know, I felt strongly about speaking up on. Got it. Now, so people are saying the audio is bad. Hold on. One, two, three. Sounds pretty good to me. But someone says it sounds like it's in a tin can. You can always log out and log back in, guys. Um, that's weird. Sounds great. Yeah, it sounds yeah. good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see. I don't even have headphones on. Yeah. I love it. Um, well, we'll keep reading some comments. Everyone's saying audio. Maybe Logan can tell me if the audio is, uh, is bad or not. Audio, audio is the best. They're saying sound. What's up with the sound? Sound is weird. Yeah, but everything. Maybe something got funky in the process. Hmm. I don't really know what to do about that. Uh, if we're live, because here, hold on, we can make it. Uh, see, someone else saying that audio is fine. Maybe I can make the uh, audio play on Facebook, and we can test it while we're doing this. But meanwhile, here I'm gonna put the thing on you off in here, and you're gonna tell me about whether the Chinese don't release this virus. <laughs> <laughs> Something non-controversial. Here's what we do: we send Logan over to Wuhan <laughs> again after. <laughs> After your music, <laughs> and he pulls a one-man Rambo investigation. Okay, he can do that. He has guns, and he confiscates the samples from the lab, and then figures out whether or not they are the original strains of COVID. The answer is maybe. I mean, yeah. Now he might have to go to the dumpster or the incinerator <laughs> to find them. He, he might end up in the dumpster or the incinerator. All right, let's listen to this audio on this computer right now and see how we do. So. Let me see. I click that. Can I turn it up? It's a one-man Rambo investigation. Okay, you can do that. It sounds good. Cool. It sounds perfect. That's beautiful. I don't know what's wrong with people. It sounds like Frank Sinatra. It does, right? It's, it's like, when the Wuhan lab, hey, releases COVID. All right. <laughs> We're going to take it to the whole damn world. Marty McCary. <laughs> It's a good time for the great taste of pandemic. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, the truth is we don't know, right? But you're, you're, you're saying like the evidence now that, that Wuhan uh, lab employees were sick in November is pretty compelling. We don't know if Abraham Lincoln really existed. Okay? <laughs> you can't know with 100% certainty. But we have enough evidence that Abraham Lincoln was a real U.S. president who lived and did several things, right? I mean, he's, right? So there are, you put pieces together, and right now, the case that it was a lab leak is as compelling as the case that Abraham Lincoln was a president of the United States. The hospital where the first cases were is five miles down the street, okay? Five miles down the street from a lab that was working on characterizing coronaviruses and had a grant from the NIH, not directly, but through EcoHealth, which listed the subcontractor as the Wuhan Virology Institute. Listen, everybody knows correlation is not there. Correlation. Is. Right. There he is. Right. I said, Monty, 
I don't know why I'm German suddenly, but I'm Fauci. You will listen to me. I will bend the curve and bend your head. Okay? So, you, you, well, okay, so let, let's... Uh, by the way, yeah, I, I uh, reached out to Dr. Fauci on Easter because... I came out of church and I felt guilty that I've been criticizing him heavily, <laughs> and I wanted to let him know that I love him, yes. that I have a lot of respect for him, and I just have a professional, different opinion, which it's good. It's, it should be healthy to have multiple scientific opinions on how to approach this. And he couldn't have been more gracious. Um, said he respected me a lot, which I don't know if that's true. I, I have to say that I respect you a lot, Marty. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's him being a nice guy. I don't actually believe it. But I mean, he is a super gentleman. I respect you. And he said we're, uh, we're actually not that far apart, that we actually are basically on the same page. And I pointed out, no, I had a completely different understanding of how we could have saved tens of thousands of more American lives if we did things differently. But I appreciate his input. And if anyone ever suggests that he doesn't intend the best for this country, I'm always quick to point out that, no, he has the best of intentions. Yeah. We should be able to have civil dialogues in this country. See, this, this, this is what I love about you, man. Like, for, first of all, you're actually truly not, like, a politically insane person. Like, it's not a thing with you. Yeah. Why would you let a political party tell you what to believe? Yeah. You are weak and pathetic, <laughs> honestly. Like, you're, uh, Jordan Peterson calls it uh, ideological possession. It's like, oh, i got to click all the boxes for blue or red, or else I, I don't have an identity. Oh, yeah. You can't I'm for yourself. I, yeah, yeah. Think for yourself. Yeah. I mean, what, do you, what do you feel about the nature? Whatever it is, you know, what's your moral palette? What do you, what do you value? Fairness versus cheating, or do you value sanctity versus cheating? cheating. Yeah. I like cheating. You, you prefer cheating. I do. I value that, and therefore I'm a Whig. Because the Whigs were known. That was the party of cheating. So you can say that, and people will know you're, you're, you're being funny. I said that, they'd be like, oh my gosh, he actually really does believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, just because you're deadpans, why are we characterizing coronaviruses in China? And first of all, doesn't China have enough money? Don't they have tens of billions of dollars? Why are we paying? Why is the U.S. federal government taxpayer dollars giving money to a Chinese lab to characterize coronaviruses? Don't we have other more pressing things like we submitted a grant on identifying the causes of Alzheimer's rejected by the NIH. We can characterize different coronaviruses and bats in Wuhan, China, accepted by the NIH. These are the things that drive me. Did, did we pivot one dime of the $40 billion NIH budget to study COVID-19 clinical research last year? No. How does it spread? Do masks work? When are you most contagious? How many people are asymptomatic? None of those answers were funded by the NIH at any point last year. And as a result, you had a vacuum of clinical information. Bedside docs were saying, hey, we need these answers. We can do the studies. We just need the resources. We couldn't pivot any of the $40 billion the NIH has. And as a result, there was a vacuum of information. We didn't have good answers for the public when they needed them. And guess what filled that vacuum? Political opinions. Listen, Marty McCurry, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the NIH funded the bat study. It wasn't about studying coronaviruses and bats in China. It was about what are the best pronouns that bats can use. The preferred. What are their preferred pronouns? Their preferred pronouns. You have to understand, because a bat could be it, it could that, be it. Yeah. it could be those, these. The binary. You have binary bats. Or non-binary. Well, listen, I speak sonar, okay, <laughs> and I've talked to many bats. They're not concerned about their pronouns. The bats are concerned about, are they going to spread a dangerous illness to humans? Yeah, now they're not concerned about their pronouns. Because I spoke to them and said, okay, what are your preferred pronouns? My preferred pronouns are ZPAC for life. <laughs> 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 that's why that's it's so common. No, actually, actually, before we do that, I, actually, I was very um, reluctant to believe this um, the China syndrome hypothesis. Hypothesis. Yeah, me too. Yeah, because it felt uh, a little xenophobic y early on. It was like it was kind of like, well, of course, they're communists, therefore three gods, they're lying about everything, which is only ninety five percent true, right? And it's probably five percent they tell the truth about. But but it's really because it, when they looked at genetic code and all that, I believe the WHO, I believe the scientists, I was like, Well, they say that it doesn't look like it, and I tend to trust science. Well, <laughs> Now you look back and you go, wait a minute, was I an idiot that thinks five miles away, the, the three of these guys get sick in November, yeah. it's kind of like, how, okay, you and I know how safe labs are, right? 
like I'm basically not safe at all. I mean, at all? With a respiratory virus? Are you uh, kidding me? I can't even, I think you keep Drosophila melanogaster in a jar without them escaping. I mean, there was almost a plague of Drosophila <laughs> after I did an experiment on Drosophila. <laughs> it, was like, it was like the 17 year Drosophila <laughs> locust. <laughs> it's true. Um, you know, what's the deal with this? Jay Byers on YouTube asks spike protein shedding, this thing that the anti vaxxers are saying. Have you heard about this? I've heard about it. I'm not sure what it means. I mean, you can create language to make something sound like it's happening, <laughs> even when it's not. I mean, you get viral particles after the virus is, is denatured or, or destroyed. Yeah, but, but what they're saying is that the mRNA vaccines create, have our body create spike protein in the deltoid muscle where it's injected. They're saying you then shed that spike protein, which then attacks females preferentially and binds to their placentas, causing miscarriages and infertility. Ah, uh, yeah. So that was a theory propagated by a German uh, a scientist. And that doctor had been like, I think he was a PhD, been run out of town in Germany. And um, it was sort of one, like the, um, the, the person who suggested the link between vaccines and autism. It was yeah. sort of, Wait, um, yeah, it, it was sort of um, along those lines. Yeah, de- uh, you know. Yaden, Yaden was his name, I think. Uh, I forget. It was one of the, and, they, and they always bill it as like the fake expert, like former Pfizer employee spills the beans. Uh, there was one spontaneous abortion in the fa- phase three clinical trial, but it was in the placebo group. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So basically, then we could say, with the equivalent fervor as the anti vaxxers, that unless you get this vaccine, you're going to have a miscarriage. Am I right, Marty McCary? Go on the record with this. I would say, do not take the placebo. <laughs> it could be dangerous. <laughs> That's the other interpretation of the data. Now, actually, that brings up a really valid point. You can look at the same data set and interpret it multiple different ways. Oh, but yeah. I think the general public thinks, oh, no, once you have data, you just have an answer, right? That's right. Or you could be like the FDA and just take a year to interpret a basic data set that could fit on a small Excel file <laughs> with zero, zero serious adverse events and 44,000 data entries. Zero. How many... I can teach them how to run a student t- t- test, and they can run as many statistical tests on the number zero as they want. There's no serious <laughs> adverse events. But but what about we need to look at the subgroups, Marty? I mean that's very important. Yeah, sure. You can look at as many subgroups as you like, and the answer is always going to be zero. Yeah. So see, this is the thing. What Marty, what you're saying is not don't rush the approval or EUA off of vaccines. Go. Oh, you have the data. You can actually do the analysis quicker than. FDA did while people are dying everywhere. If the FDA were a transparent U.S. institution and it were competent, they would have made available to the public the application upon receipt of the application. All these folks that tell me, oh, this FDA has got to take their time, they don't know anything about the processes over there. Mm-hmm. They need to do every check they normally do, but they need it to work a little faster. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that if um, – you look at that 132-page application of the FDA, mm. the vast majority of that information either could have been collected and reviewed before the clinical trial was completed, like the manufacturing data. Mm. Right? Why did they have to wait until the trial is done to review how it was manufactured? And they don't need to, like, get the EUA notarized and, you know, find a stapler and send it to Betty and the, Department of Plain English, you mentioned. That's yeah, a yeah. real department at CMS. Really? Yeah, the Department of Plain English. And they try to make sure everything they put out is understandable to everybody. That's I want to work in that department because you get to translate, like, a mutagenesis and just go, yeah, that's called um, weirdness. You could work in the Department of Plain English or the Department of Complex English or the Department of Broken English. You're versatile. You know what? All three of those are just called any English department in the United States right now in an academic setting. <laughs> it's like in the same setting, like they have these the most concrete language, and then they also have um, they have uh, 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 they use words like concatenate. I'm going to take that word. I don't know what it is, but I, I speak hieroglyphics, so I'll use my Rosetta Stone. And you I'm, are, I'm not talking about the software, I'm talking about the, <laughs> the actual Rosetta Stone to decode that. You know, my, my mom and dad grew up in Egypt, and um, they would just never believe anything the government says. It's like the CDC is saying this, or, you know, it's just like, why would you believe well, anything? Because they're just used to government that doesn't make any sense. That's right, it's state-controlled TV. So when they hear China says that the 
COVID-19 comes from a frozen food package that came from Europe. <laughs> That's what they said. Like, and actually what they said. <laughs> they're just, they're not even laughing. They're like, of course, the government, yeah. why would a government not ever tell you the truth? Yeah. And you know, they're right about authoritarian governments. I mean, that's probably 100% right. That's why we didn't hear about the UFOs until recently. Wait, what? There's yeah. UFOs. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I saw one coming in today, actually. <laughs> it said Southwest on it. I don't quite understand <laughs> like why aliens would, would identify by geography. I mean, that's their pronouns. <laughs> Southwest. South slash West. Oh, man. We are so canceled. Oh, yeah. Amazon Web Services canceled us. Yeah, it's so already funny. deleted. I mean, we only have a 1,000 people watching us live on Facebook and another 500 on YouTube. So I'm pretty sure Amazon is just like, fire up the cancellator. I don't know why everyone speaks with a German accent these days in my world. Boris. It's Boris. It's Boris. Yes, Natasha. Cancel them. Let's read comment, okay? Uh, Jason Flood says, the all the left and right channels out of phase would be better if switched to mono. That's weird. I'll, uh, you know what? You talk for a second. I'm going to fix audio while they talk. I think they're liars because Logan says audio sounds good. I go with Logan 100% of the time. I probably would too because he's actually right. No, uh, Logan is probably closer to a Nobel Prize. Than most people I know. <laughs> if Logan's listening out there, when you bow for a Nobel Prize, you need to bow at 15 degrees. Okay, Logan. If you go any, if you go any lower than that, it's disrespectful. And if you don't go at least 15 degrees. They won't be able to get the Nobel Prize around your neck. Okay, you can <laughs> remember that. That's free advice. <laughs> oh man, we had to full airtime while I went and plugged in a device. Oh, That's I can amazing. go. You want? You, you, you're a pro media doctor. Do you want me to push product? I can push. Oh, product. I got product. Push this Fauci. <laughs> Tell me how you would sell the Fauci bobblehead while I fix the audio here. Well, supposedly um, medical school admissions are way up in the United States, and it's in part due to our friend. Um, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, well-intended, nice guy who's a gentleman, a darling of the media, and in fact, a full-time interviewee for the last 15 months. I don't know where this guy finds time to do work. I, I see him on podcasts that I have never heard of that I remember. I know why that's familiar. They've asked me to be on, and I told him I don't have time to go on. <laughs> and they have Dr. Fauci to go on. This guy is like, and I'm not that big of a deal. And Dr. Fauci goes on like every single thing. God bless him. God bless him. But he threw a real mean, threw a real mean pitch at that game, though, didn't he? Well, yeah, there we go. We're back. Okay, did that fix the audio? It might have. It sounds better already. Let's quit that. There we go. Oh, shit. I quit the wrong computer. <laughs> Damn it. I have no idea if we're still streaming. Hold on. Oh, my God. We'll find out. Oh, looks like we are. Okay, good. <laughs> All I need is a thumbs up from Logan, and I feel good. This is a comedy of errors, dude. Hold on. I got two mice, two keyboards, two computers going. I'm trying to stream in 4K to two platforms with a guest live. This is like when you're doing a Zoom conference call, like you're giving a talk on Zoom or something, and you see the number of participants dropping <laughs> as you're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's my favorite. I see that happen, and I'll comment on it. I'll go, looks like that one hit a nerve. <laughs> Half the, half the audience disappeared. <laughs> the virtual talks are a trip, man. What do you think about the whole well, thing? Well, I think, first of all, <clears throat> anyone that uses Cisco WebEx or Microsoft Teams <laughs> should, should immediately get with the program and switch to Zoom because um, I don't get it. I don't know why people don't use Zoom. And when, when you tell them, hey, why don't you use Zoom? It's about 50 times easier. They say, oh, well, it, it's not as cyber secure and doesn't work with our and Of course it's not cyber secure. The cyber criminals can't figure out Microsoft Teams. It's too, con <laughs> it's too confusing. They can't, they can't hack it. It's too confusing to get it. <laughs> Microsoft Teams. So every time I speak for a healthcare organization via Zoom, like, we use Microsoft Teams because of HIPAA compliance and we would not want to be hacked. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to work well. So, where's, by the way, here's your yeah. EHR. Oh, it's in the hands of Russian hackers. Yeah, HIPAA. E stands for patient. There's no patience on the call. Amazing. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. And I have to go through all these hoops. Like, oh, we have to get you an account, but then we have to get you a special encryption key. And then, oh, and then every single time when we're about to go live, they can't get it to work. And it's always Betty in IT. Yeah. It's like, it's like, she's like, well, I don't normally do this. I'm actually here for patient care. But I don't, so I don't know why we're using Microsoft Teams, which is completely obsolete for any meaningful video conferencing. Yeah. It, it's the worst time. Is the worst, and, and you know that's one of those pandemic things that I hope they just fake, but they just they just get rid of. Oh, so wait, you, is it is it patient health information privacy act? HIPAA. 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 So HIPAA. where's the and portability? That's portability. the second yeah, right. Portability. And you know your laws. Yeah. What? Okay. Tell me what HR six four two is. Uh, it means that if you have a problem with your perineum, you cannot publicly refer to it as your taint. What's the closest you've ever come to a bald eagle? 23 meters, and I used the metric system for a reason. It was in Canada. I love it, man. You, you're sharp. You know, you're, sure, you, you're, you're, around. you're going right to age 110. And be 100% seen out by age 60. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some comments here. Um, why can't you donate blood plasma after being vaccinated, Grandma McAlpine? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, maybe you don't make the right antibody? I don't know what it is. Can't you? Good question. Actually, I actually don't know. Two doctors here, neither one of us know or really care that much. Uh, but, you know, because here's the thing. Get vaccinated. That's your plasma. Ah, right. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you, you, you would think that makes all the sense in the world, right? right. You're getting more antibodies than you are sometimes from, from natural infection. infection. Yeah, from natural infection. But I guess with the abundance and availability of, of uh, vaccines, you just, there'd be no need for that, right? Yeah, that's what it feels like. Now, someone can correct us and see me. It's one of those things where we don't know the answer. I'm sure somebody will. Yeah, I'm, oh, oh, yeah, they will. Uh, Joseph Weir on YouTube says, who decides when a booster is needed? Oh, man, yeah. this is a good one. The CEO of Pfizer. The CEO of Pfizer. Pfizer. Yeah, they decide. Yeah, they decide. In their clinical wisdom, mm -hmm. as they did, the Moderna CEO said on, on CNN. Or was it Pfizer? Um, I think it was the Moderna CEO. Cause, oh, because I know Moderna's working on this combo flu and booster shot. The Pfizer CEO, what's his name, Durhal, blah, 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 was like, yeah, we're, going, we're most likely going to require a booster in the fall. Yeah. Like, I don't think you know what that word means. Yeah, I think he did say that now. Yeah. And if I have it wrong, they're both welcome to sue me, right? Now. <laughs> and they will. <laughs> yeah, they will. Yeah. And somehow I'll be named as a, a party in this. Well, so. you know, lucky for us, the line is so long, they'll never get their day in court. <laughs> but you're right. Why are they deciding? I mean, if it were up to them, I think they're, we'd get a booster every Monday morning when we show up to work. Yeah. And the shareholders would love it. But the virologists are split on this. And I've had a couple really good conversations with virologists uh, for MedPage today. Mm -hmm. And they have said, look, it's a, kind of a 50-50 thing. And one person I really respect mm -hmm. says, look, vaccinated immunity is probably lifelong. We probably don't need boosters for the general population, maybe for certain older people and certainly for those immunosuppressed, based on the work of Dr. Segev. But you know, why are we talking about boosters this excessively now? Let's wait till we get there. If the data suggests that we need them, and right now I think when you talk about how boosters are so likely, and booster, 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 you're going to have fewer people, I think, get the vaccine who otherwise would. Bro, I could not agree more. Like the minute Pfizer dude opened his flap hole about that, I was like, shut your flap hole. Like nobody knows. Nobody knows the answer to this. And honestly, nobody should care. Except the shareholders care. It's all the shareholders. Right, of course, because how are you going to? Continue to generate revenue once that first shot, if the shot is lifelong, that's the worst kind of pharma intervention. we got to stop shaming people who choose not to get the vaccine. The idea that we're going to argue this on MSNBC extensively enough that they're going to change their mind, that's not the right approach. How about we respect those who choose not to get it, but make vaccines abundantly more available and routine aspects of people's everyday life in America. So make it convenient. Convenient. Can you imagine you come out of the grocery store and somebody says, do you have five minutes to get immunized from COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And it's right there and somebody with a smile says we can do it right now. Dude, you're in the strip club. You're up in the champagne room. Okay. Instead of a, me neither. Instead of referring to the, the whole club. I just <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a lap dance, they give you a... Vaccination. I mean, you're combining 
two things at once. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. Two tastes that belong not together at all, yet somehow they work. Am I right? Am I right, Monty McCary? Can we do this in strip clubs? We could do it. WWFD. What yeah. would Fauci do? I think he, he would support the idea. <laughs> he would find a way, first of all, not to answer the question. Because <laughs> that guy has more non-answers than I've ever seen any person in public life. And that's probably why he has been there now for eight U.S. presidents. He has served eight U.S. That's presidents. That's how you survive. That's, that's, how, you that's how you survive. Become a media chameleon. <laughs> so, um, look, we got to make it more available, more accessible, and that's going to be the thing. And by the way, if you ignore natural immunity, which um, some people, I'm not going to say who, but some people <laughs> have been doing, and Dr. Walensky, by not talking about it, um, you know, these are wonderful doctors, but let me, let me know, email me, or let me know if you ever hear our nation's public health leaders talk about natural immunity. It's half of the population, and it's half of the unvaccinated population, which is why 80 to 85 percent of adults today have immunity, and that's why we're seeing cases plummet. It caught our public leaders off guard, and that's why you're seeing the rushed guidance that came out without any notice two weeks ago. And you can take off your mask if you're fully vaccinated. You know, this is this brings up a point: Are we ever going to trust? anybody in authority again to tell us any truth at all. Well, the Harvard study shows that 52% of Americans do not trust the CDC. That's a real tragedy. Well, you know what? I don't trust Harvard. So, <laughs> well, that's inception right there. Harvard, by the way, Harvard is barely an educational institution. They're a hedge fund. Oh, that's true. <laughs> it's so all much big, Oh, my god. They're investing all over. They probably made billions on COVID. I bet you Harvard made billions on COVID. We should do that. We should find out. We should do an investigative journalistic thing. You and me. Yeah. We could be the, the two brown guys that, like, take down a, a, a conglomerate that's mostly also brown guys. Actually, no. Is that, what is Harvard's? Actually, this is, a, this is a thing of yours, right? That the major medical journals are, like, the boards are, like, 100% white men. Yeah, the New England Journal of Medicine um, decided to put one African-American on their board of 51 people. 51 people are on the, are on the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine. When, and we get papers rejected over and over again. Uh, if you know my research, we push the field. Right? We challenge the Orphan Drug Act on how it's being gained. We talk about people dying not from the illness that brings them to care, but from the care itself. We talk about how we can streamline care, redesign care, predatory billing, price gouging. Over and over, we've sent papers to the New England Journal of Medicine. And we get a lot of these into JAMA, and we get a lot of these into top journals, but almost never, only once, twice have I ever published in the New England Journal of Medicine, out of maybe 400 submissions. They have group think. And I'm not saying it's white old man group, group think. It's group think from a non-diverse group because there's no age diversity. Where's the interest in social justice issues and sort of their social justice issues? Like, well, if my country club membership expires, where's the justice in that? I have to reapply from scratch. <laughs> right, Marty? Well, um, by the way, I, look, let's be honest. I, I mean, look, and I'll, I'll let you finish, but i got to say this. Part of the reason that your papers don't get accepted is that you have research topics that really are unorthodox, like the things you mentioned, but also studying, um, you know, paranormal activity, ectoplasm generation, um, ghost haunting and possession. Like, that's just not run of the bit. Dr. Beckman, you, sir, are a poor scientist. All right? <laughs> <laughs> that was a problem in Ghostbusters, but for you, so you were going to say something about your, about this issue. When I um, came to Johns Hopkins, there were 80 cardiologists. I think it was 80, but between 60 and 80. But there were at least 60 cardiologists and not a single African American in a city that serves a majority of African Americans. Now, did somebody say, hey, stop, let's look at this. This is, we could learn from the perspective of uh, someone that thinks differently or has a different life experience or background. And diversity is not just racial diversity. It's uh, gender diversity. It's age diversity. It's background, life experience, international experience. So we can learn a lot from a different perspective, and I think we, we've been missing that. Well, I think, actually, that leads right into the question from M. Desai on YouTube, who sent me a little tip. The price we pay is great, Dr. M. Your next book should be on the payer side 
I'm an actuarial at BCBS, Blue Cross Blue Shield. The inefficiency in insurance is insane. Now, this is your week, of course, the price we pay coming on paperback June 8th. You can pre-order it now. The reason you should pre-order it on paperback is that it will bump into the New York Times bestseller list, which means this becomes an even bigger movement than it became when the hardcover came out. So what do you think about insurance, my boy? Well, he's right, um, and I've heard a lot of people like him speak out about how things could be done in a uh, more streamlined fashion. If you think about this system, pre-authorization before, post-authorization afterwards, a bunch of love and disclaimers with pre-authorization. It's approved, but footnote, this does not mean that payment is guaranteed. Well, right. why didn't we do that? <laughs> That's right. And then claims adjudication, paying a licensing fee to the AMA, which benefits from this whole coding jungle. Oh, yes, they do. Um, bad debt collection, mm-hmm. appeals, customer service, mm-hmm. sending bills out. All of that junk costs a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And what you're seeing now is doctors and hospitals and sometimes employers say, hey, we want to bypass all of that. We want to have a local relationship where there's accountability. Mm-hmm. And let's have a direct contract. And guess what? These direct contracts are coming in 30%, maybe more, below what the hospitals are otherwise getting. And they're saying yes to it because they don't have to do all that wasteful spending. If you make things easier and streamline it, you can cut a butt ton of costs. And, and you know what? All the jobs that you lose there, the people are like, well, but if we, if we streamline insurance and bureaucracy, what will happen to Bob's job? Right now, he's been in the basement with his favorite stapler, and he doesn't even know he's been fired three years ago. And, you know, what? Do we, yeah, it's called retrain them to actually be working in a system that's fully redesigned, which is, again, part of the book. He's like redesigning healthcare. Yeah, the redesign of healthcare. And there's no, there's no residency for the redesign of healthcare. There's no MBA program for it. But it's what you talk about when you talk about healthcare 3.0. Mm-hmm. And it's what I'm trying to write about. And what you can only do at a certain point in your career when you don't have to play the games of getting an abstract accepted at your local specialty meeting mm-hmm. and presenting to a bunch of people, half of whom are on the golf course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, usually that's me. Do me too. Getting the CME. Yeah, getting the CME. Yeah. And the other half were just saying, mm, that's kind of, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. And we're talking to ourselves. We gotta get out there. We gotta be writing op eds. We gotta go on cable news. We gotta speak truth to what we see. Doctors have an incredible heritage of being a voice for those who are underrepresented in society, the most vulnerable members of our society. And that's the exciting revolution that's happening right now. I, I, you are truly evangelizing what I believe deeply. And uh, Kanish sent me a little $10 tip on YouTube because it just says thank you. Oh, thank you. Marty, I'm not splitting it with you. <laughs> you don't get it. Um, Let's see, someone had a good question here uh, in between complaining about the audio, which I still don't understand because the audio is fine. Um, let's see, how well, people keep, like half the people think the audio is fine and the other don't. Well, this is for the people who think the audio is fine. Um, don't forget the PBMs, says him. Yeah. Many insurance companies own their own PBM systems, Optum and United. Aetna and CBS Care Markets, literally a monopoly conflict of interest. It's crazy. Dude, talk about this, man. So PBMs are gouging employers left and right, and they can't understand the drugs. They don't know the names, the doses, and the frequency. So when they get the report on here's what you spent on, on your PBM plan by drug, they don't know how to comparison shop. They created a medication called Duexis, which is like ibuprofen and uh, proton pump and everything. It's a combo drug, which individually costs pennies, right? But it's a combination, and they're paying like 60 bucks for it. Employers don't know what Duex is. There's so many of these games. Oh, my God. I talk about PBMs, and there's some good people out there now talking about it, too. But um, uh, on, the, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the pharma front, there's a lot of opportunities there. By the way, pharma is kind of sick of PBMs. Too. Yeah, they're done with it, and in fact, they each point the finger at each other, but it's kind of funny because <clears throat> the, there's a series, I did an interview with um, a doc who's working with Mark Cuban to democratize, like really just create generic drugs, uh, yeah. re- actually manufacture them themselves, and sell them at a, at a discount rate, like, mm-hmm. and, and these are the drugs that are, they're not just any old drugs, they're the drugs that are the most jacked up by pharma, uh, right, like, yeah. you know, and I think... It's really interesting because most of the problem is you cut, you cut out middlemen. You just go right to the manufacturer, and it works.
works great. Yeah. Now, why do we do this in healthcare? It's because it's generating. But why do you think it's like you know 30 or 40 of our GDP if you count? All the government spending, if you count the, un, the hidden costs like home care giving, the social security checks that you've pointed out that pay for health care, like deductibles and things like that. Yeah. When you put in that math, it comes out to like, what, 48%, 48% of 48% of all federal spending goes to health care in its many hidden forms. So when you got to pay your taxes, think about that as you're writing the check. It's Medicare and Medicaid. It's half of social security. It's... 15% of the Defense Department's budget goes to health care for their own health care system. Their own people. Yeah, it's separate from the VA. Right. And then we pay for health care benefits from 9 million federal workers. And then we have interest on the debt, which is in part interest on the spending debt, you know, on health care. And that comes out to 48%. 48%. Yeah, we published this in USA Today and on our restoringmedicine.org reports page. And by the way, I just had to laugh for a second. You're like, yeah, I published this in the famous journal, USA Today. Uh, yeah, we're over the journals. I mean, we would send that to peer review for nine months. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. How about just post it online the next day after we get two other doctors we know to read it? You know what would be nice is if my show was considered like an actual source of information. It is a journal. It is a journal. Sure. I should start predatory journal practices <laughs> like uh, i could get like you know like you know joseph mercola who like sells like tanning beds and like anti-vaccine garbage and be like joe listen you and i haven't always gotten along we don't see eye to eye but i could see eye to eye if you could eye me like a million bucks you come on the show you tell me all about all the woo-woo you're selling i will pitch it this is a journal for hire there are journals like that right oh yeah yeah there's all kinds of sham journals and journals are getting in trouble right now and they're in a free fall the government funds research with taxpayer dollars, and that research you cannot read on a journal because it's paywalled. Mm-hmm. And they created a rule because of all the frustration around that to say they have to make it public, but they only have to make it public for a matter of months, and then it goes behind the paywall again. Mm-hmm. So NIH-funded work with taxpayers, profiting journals, they won't even let people read the research. Mm-hmm. And then you've got discoveries and billionaires that come out of the, the, the discoveries, and none of that money, the NIH doesn't take any equity in those discoveries of the research that they fund. That seems to make perfect sense. Uh, by the way, uh, Ball Boys on, his great name, on <laughs> YouTube <laughs> says, we need a journal of Twitter where everybody gets retracted. <laughs> Ball Boys, is that the name? Yeah. The, Ball Boys may be interested in meeting one of my followers on Twitter named First Amendment and Boobs. <laughs> I know that person. You know that person? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They follow they follow me, too. I think. Yeah, they make nice comments. They actually. do. Yeah. You know, they're really pretty woke for uh, somebody who has a name that just needs one more thing to make it perfect, you know? Yeah, I don't know what that person looks like, because I think it's a smiley face. Right, which is exactly what they look like. There's a phenotype. I mean, the genetics just all make sense. Um, we got some great comments here. Uh, let's see. The way they decide, Furious TV says the way they decided to choose those who uh, will get to survive the poll reversal through a lottery, through forced vax. Oh, this is a great one. All right. It's an anti-vax loony. So, and I say loony because just listen to this. The way they decide to choose those who will get to survive the poll reversal is through a lottery, through forced vax with two X's because it's just more scary than one X. Um, they are afraid of a population panic poll reversal is coming. What the hell is poll reversal? Have you heard about this thing? Magnetic polls? I have no idea. A change in, like, Polish people's, like, stance on something? A pole is like a metal rod, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, it has several definitions in Webster. Uh, <laughs> Webster. <laughs> Don't make me Google it. You know You know what's crazy? Look, let's be honest right now. I, I've got a finger on a button switching cameras. I've got comments over here streaming. I've got Locked people on. yelling about audio. I've got that thing making sure it's streaming. And I'm trying to talk to you. Um, I could use a little pole reversal. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I really could. I don't you know do what it is, but I want it in my life. You do. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, well, you, after this, we're going to get you depolarized somehow. <laughs> um, Ball Boy says, hold on, my tinfoil hat from Amazon Prime hasn't arrived yet. I love it. Ball Boy's got it on Amazon Prime. Like, he couldn't wait. Like, he wanted a drone to deliver it. He's like, man, I need the protection from these, <laughs> from these rays right now. Um, Ball Boy's is my new hero. Uh, Alarna Curry says, uh, Every so many thousands of years, the north and south pole switch, right? So, pole reversal. Oh. That's what I thought it was, like magnetic pole. What does that have to do with vaccines and depopulation? I don't know, but there's a lot of, you know, interesting theories on vaccines. And if uh, if we, you know, get to this 
those situations where we are like pushing it so hard through financial incentives. Well, like these million dollar lotteries. Yeah, is that, that really? Oh, this is disgusting. <laughs> Let's be honest. Just are we treating people like they're like they're like what's wrong? How about just set up a table at the county fair? How about just set up a mobile clinic to go into neighborhoods that otherwise, you know, may have child care issues and they can't schedule an appointment online? Mm. Uh, that's how we're going to deal with this. By the way, we're at very low levels right now, and we're going even further down. Mm. And we shouldn't be chasing after eradication. Yeah, this is crazy. COVID zero. Like, yeah. I mean, there are people on there going, we should get to COVID zero because New Zealand did it. It's like New Zealand had the good grace to be in the southern hemisphere, be geographically isolated, (laughs) and uh, able to shut down before they had significant community spread. Yeah. Great for New Zealand. We have been moving the goalposts so much, and it's one of the reasons why people are not trusting public health officials anymore. So we basically are at herd immunity right now, right? Mm -hmm. We're basically, we have one-tenth the number of daily cases of a mild flu season. And a mild flu season will have about 400,000 cases a day. We're at about 25,000 cases a day. We're below one-tenth the number of daily cases as the flu and the same case fatality rate. In the past, it wasn't. COVID was much more dangerous. Right. Now it's the same because it's the younger people. So let, 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 let's unpack everything you just said because it's crucial. Um, and plus, it gets my hand off that, that button. It's like a tennis elbow. So it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna be on me for a second. All right, what Marty is saying all right, is that now the cases are low enough that they've actually – they're actually less than what you typically have in the flu season. Now everyone will say, well, but wait, the flu's less deadly on a case-per-case basis than COVID, except that that's not necessarily true anymore because case fatality, infection fatality rates, depending on what you're looking at, change based on, number one, how good you are at treating it, number two, the vulnerability of the population that's getting infected. And now, because we vaccinated most of our elders or they've already had COVID, we have now shifted to younger people getting it. In fact, so even when you see cases, they're less likely to die, which means the infection fatality and case fatality rate drop. Does that make sense? So that's the in-depth, and it just got my finger off the button for a second. And that, that case fatality rate's 1.3 per 10,000 with flu. Yeah. And with COVID, it's 1.1 to 1.4 per 10,000. Currently, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and because that's all the under 50. Right, right, right. And the inf- that's case fatality. So that's of everyone who's diagnosed how many people die. Right. Infection fatalities of everyone who we think is infected, even though we haven't tested them, yeah. and we can extrapolate from seroprevalence studies. And Jay Bhattacharya was on the show talking about that. Yeah. Wait, how do you think Jay has been treated by the media and the mainstream based on the, the contrary opinions he's taken on COVID? I mean, what do I think of him being excoriated by the media and the medical establishment? I think it's tragic that we're not listening to different points of view. Um, and when I first heard the idea of um, what they're what they've been um, advancing i i just thought I, i'm not on board with it right? i just don't like it. the more i've learned the more it sounds like it's far more plausible and far more reasonable as a strategy than i previously thought and i still honestly don't know but i do know this jay intends the best for he only wants the best for people he has the best heart and i've known him before and he's a good person I, I agree, and it's interesting when in the early days, you know, it all depends on what's going on in the news and what's happening with numbers of cases, but you can kind of go, oh, man, it kind of feels like maybe they're right or no, I don't know if they're wrong now. Maybe we should be more aggressive with, you know, universal masking and pushing for closures of businesses that are high risk. But wait, though, it's start, they're starting to feel right because look what's happening in schools and kids are really stepping back and the ancillary damage of this is big. And that's how science is. It's this kind of push and pull. And the thing that you said about Jay about him being a good person, off camera here, he's been here twice. He is one of the sweetest, most compassionate, and he feels called to talk about those calls. It's nothing but downside for him. I just hit a fader by accident. Jay. Slow fade to see. <laughs> Slow fade to Marty. This is like, do all the girls I've loved before. And then you got to go, people have the same trouble in and out. Just move your lips. My door. I'm glad they've came along. I dedicate this song to all the girls I've loved. Before <laughs> we've truly gone off the rails, I love it. Um, let's read some. Uh, let's read some comments here. Um, okay, fifty uh, percent of the comments I get after we we do one of our one of our uh, conversations are complimentary of the singing. People love the singing when you sing in there. Uh, 
but that's not the, the, the feedback I hear. Uh, I hear like, hey, can you never sing again? <laughs> that's mostly my family. Um, Sarah Gerard has a good comment here. I want my kids to be fully vaccinated, but now with these new myocarditis claims, I'm hesitating. Can we please discuss it? Do one dose then. Do one dose. I mean, why is it all or nothing? Why is it all or nothing? If somebody had COVID before, isn't it reasonable for them to do one dose? Does getting COVID count for at least one dose? I'm an immunity denier. I don't think natural immunity is a real thing. So, no, Marty. Yeah, you and, and some other. <laughs> I'm so glad I had that prop. He's just come so in handy. So unfair. Oh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, you know, you said he was a really sweet when you talked to him. He's terrific. Uh, and and uh, he will. Wait a minute. Flatten the curve. You can't see it. I can't switch the camera and hold Fauci up with that arm. Man, my tennis elbow's killing me from a mouse. I'll operate on Okay, you got it. All right, here we go. There we go. There he is. Flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. Yeah. Flatten the curve. You know, George Takai in Star Trek IV, uh, when they're flying in, they go back in time to current, like, 20th century San Francisco. And Sulu, Mr. Sulu, uh, is flying in, and, and he goes, San Francisco, I was born there. And I'll never forget that moment in acting history. Okay, George Takai coming home to San Francisco. Does it have relevance to COVID? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so another question. So someone asked me to discuss something. What is it? Uh, it was, can Dr. Marty come to lunch with us? Says John and Lucy. Oh, yeah, I'm doing a lunch with John. She won a, um, a raffle from HPNA, the Hospice Palliative Nurse Association, raffle level lunch with me. I would have paid not to have lunch with me. They raised a bunch of thousands of dollars, and uh, John won. She's one of my supporters. Anyone in palliative medicine is salt of the earth. Hero. I mean, they, they are heroes in society. And gosh, anything I can do to support them. Yeah. And, and maybe they could help me. I've been writing my li- living will, and so maybe they could look over. I don't think they <laughs> My living will will is already dead. That's the thing. I had to write a will for my will. Actually, let's let's talk about the myocarditis thing because I think this feels a lot of anti-vax sentiment. Yeah. So they're they're talking about seeing some cases of myocarditis, heart inflammation in younger uh, people who've gotten the vaccine, and they were looking at this in Israel too with the Pfizer vaccine, like saying, "Oh, we're seeing some cases of myocarditis," but it has not been clearly shown that they're above and beyond the natural background, right, and that they're actually caused by the vaccine. So we can assume two things. It's a spurious thing and it's not true because this, this syndrome does happen. We know that COVID itself actually causes that syndrome um, and worse. Uh, or it's true. And then how do we think about the vaccine if it's true? So let's, let's parse some of that for people. Well, first of all, we need to be able to move quickly with research. We can't be filing for an NIH RFP and then submit the comments. Then it goes to a study section. This is the absurdity of what the NIH was doing during COVID. But we can't fund this because we already have our funding allocated to research on Mexican hairless dogs <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. That's, 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 that's the important research. Okay, bro. <laughs> so, um, like, I, I, I don't know, but it's the arguments that I've heard at MedPage did a piece on this, on, on the uh, heart complications that have been suggested from the vaccine. And it appeared, at least from that report, there was no association. Remember, there was a report that came out early on that said 4,000 people in Sweden died after receiving the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess who's getting the vaccine first? People in nursing homes who, who are dying at a rate that equal that same amount. I keep talking about that. People are like, look at the vaccine adverse event reporting system. It's, it's more deaths than has ever been reported to the vaccine. It's the first vaccine we're giving to like 90 year olds on a regular basis across the population. And people's sphincter tone is so high about it that they're reporting deaths. Like normally, look, you get a flu shot, two weeks later you die of pneumonia. You're not gonna report it to the vaccine adverse event reporting system as a flu related death or flu shot related death. But with COVID, everybody's like quite vigilant. So this is how they report data. Do you want to know the real story on the post-approval reporting system, the VARA system that the NIA, that this FDA has for medication complications self-reporting? It is a terrible self-reporting system by design. Do you think pharma companies want to have a robust system to track complications after a medication has been approved by the FDA. <laughs> hey, let's yeah get Congress to, because what the FDA does is it's not their decision. It's all congressionally funded, right? So do you think pharma wants Congress to fund a really strong mechanism 
to do surveillance on medications after they are approved, or you get your approval, go out and do whatever you want. If you create a robust surveillance system that really tracks what's happening after, you know, the first uh, 5,000 people that get something after it's approved, you're going to run the risk of discovering something that could result in a recall or a warning or an advisory. Did this pharma want that? No, they want a shanty post-approval reporting process. So do you, but do you think that's what's happening with vaccines then? Because not all these complications may be reported. Are we missing something? Well, I think it's a structural issue. It's been around. It's been like that for a long time. We've been arguing that with robotic surgery, with the oh, yeah. intuitive robot. Right, right, right. Why were we not tracking every patient that had surgery with the robot right. for the first year or 10 years after it was FDA approved? Instead of discovering it, you know, we kind of blew the lid on that one. You know, 10 years after it was FDA approved, we started writing our research articles on robot surgery-related complications that were unique to the robot. Now, since then, the robot's gotten better. People are more skilled. Right. It's but become self-aware. Yeah. And it's going to try to kill us all. <laughs> but why aren't we tracking? Why were not we not tracking outcomes in, in everyone who had it done after FDA approval? We should be doing that now. Yeah. I, I don't, look, if there were real associations with the vaccine that we would have seen with the mRNA va- vaccines, doctors would have spoken up. Because that's, that's the thing. thing. That's the thing. Everybody in healthcare is actually on alert for this stuff because they have to get the vaccine too. So their skin's in the game. It's a yeah. really unique situation. That's why I think, you know, I think these concerns are they're all valid. Like you should ask these questions. Absolutely. The myocarditis, thing, let's say it's true. If it's rare, then you have to do a risk benefit with your kid. Go, look, I get myocarditis. Most of it gets better. What if they get COVID? Would they have gotten myocarditis from that? And the answer is probably. It's just like a Guillain-Barre. We won't be thinking. It's just like Guillain-Barre. Flu itself is like an order of magnitude more likely to give you the outbreak than the flu shot. So it's kind of like, well, we don't really understand how to process risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's right. Yeah. Um, and um, on the, um, on the um, complication rate, um, you know, another thing that has to be factored in is um, the post-inflammatory response syndrome, MISC. Yeah. Okay. The post-inflammatory Medical Inflammatory uh, uh, Syndrome in Children, yeah. MISC. There was a study that showed there was about 1,500, or they described 1,500 cases. My research team took that, and we said, how many cases are there in the United States? Because that was a sample from X number of hospitals. So we characterized the hospitals that we reported into that paper, and we extrapolated that there were probably 10,000 cases of MISC from COVID in children. Now, MISC, as Dr. Paul often says, and he's come on here saying, if you can see it up front and personal, it's brutal, right? Kids are in the hospital, they're in pain, it's uncomfortable, there's long-term health complications. The survival rate's over 99%, but still, if you can prevent that, that is a reason for kids to get the vaccine. Right. So, it's, a, it's in other words, the comp- complex risk benefit with, with kids, there's MISC, there's actual injury from COVID, which almost entirely happens in kids with other risk factors. Right? That's right. You looked at that. Only kids with pre-existing conditions or chronic conditions have, are at risk of death from our analysis of half of the nation's insurance data. Right. In other words, no perfectly healthy kid has ever died of COVID. That's fascinating. Now, it, there may be a case out there, but out of the 230-some cases, right. it appears that all of them had some chronic condition. Right, right, right. But remember, Marty, we shut down schools, even though we knew we could mask kids and mask teachers and be okay and safe. We shut down schools. We still are having trouble opening schools in some places, like where I live. Um, yeah, so let's just so go ahead. Two COVID cases last Wednesday. Two. That's too, too many, Marty. That's too, too many. And what if they were asymptomatic? That's even more too many <laughs> because they could have spread it to someone else who would be asymptomatically infected. And the kids with two cases in the whole city on, on Wednesday, the kids are still at home three days a week and two days of in-person in the city of San Francisco. Yep. And when they show up, there's no teacher. They're looking at there's some screen and they're spaced out five miles apart because the teacher has to be able to broadcast. And this is the insanity. We're going to be learning more about the health consequences of shutting kids out of school, and it's not going to be pretty. Remember the study in the New England Journal of Medicine? <laughs> I, can't, I can't even say that name seriously now. 
and the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> the New England Journal of Medicine is now a joke between me and Marty. It's like, oh, those hacks. It's, it's just, it's frustrating. You can't criticize them because you might not get your next paper or commentary accepted. People are afraid to criticize them. But who, who holds the NIH purse strings for grants? Mr. Flat Curve. So if, if you're a doc and you disagree, you can't speak publicly about it because you might lose your grant. People are going to think we're some voodoo, you know, artists here. What does this think? <laughs> Who do you think we are, Marty? Like, we're like we're like those twins from G.I. Joe that you stab one of them and the other one feels pain. It's like that. That's who we are. We're unnatural and possibly a cult. That's so funny. I don't even remember what I was going to say about oh, the right. journal medicine. Oh, you were journal medicine about um, kids. Um, kids in school. Oh, so do you remember Hurricane Maria? Yes. Um, Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico. Yeah. Devastated Puerto Rico. There were some early reports, and some of this was for political uh, purposes. They were saying only seven people have died you know, in the first couple of days. Then a couple of days later, hey, only 14 people have died. Only 14. Right. And look at Hurricane Katrina. Over 1,000 people died. This is 14. Right. You know, this was a disgusting argument that was happening, right? New England Journal has a bunch, no, I don't believe the New England Journal out of this, a bunch of researchers. Go down to Puerto Rico and try to assess the real casualties from Hurricane Katrina Maria. Mm-hmm. And what they find is that 5,000 people died. Right? People couldn't get dialysis care, they couldn't get their medications, yeah. poor water access, sanitation. Kind of like what happened in Texas after the power outage. Yeah. yeah. So that's what's going to happen with schools and oh. kids being shut out. We're only going to learn more about self harm and all kinds of problems with kids. From I, kids being shut out of school. And I wish. Dr. Walensky and Dr. Fauci would speak up about kids being shut out of school because they know that this is really different. They're smart people. They know it's true, but I'm sure there's like a teacher's union person in their ear. Um, you know, and, and this is the thing, like, teachers should have a union. They have a tough job. They're very important. So, but, but they should also be educated as to the sides of this. I mean, we try, and I have a lot of teachers who reach out on both sides of this to me, and they're very reasonable people. They want to do the right thing yes. for kids, actually. That's the thing. And uh, it's been just really, it's been heartbreaking. I mean, when you see what's happening with kids, like, look, I have my two privileged little, spoiled little brats. <laughs> they, um, you know, they're not, they've not been in in-person school. They have, I got had to get one of them a new MacBook because the other one wasn't, it was, the fan was so loud you couldn't think. Like, this is the first <laughs> world problem. Right? Right. So, the fan was, this fan is so loud, Daddy. And I was like, on a Mac, on a Mac. What well, was it? It was because it was from 2008. So it's our old MacBook, you know, whatever. Barely hanging on, but the thing is, the truth is, I just wanted a new Mac in the house. So I was like, here you go, girl, I did this for you, but I did it for Devin. I can do that. Yeah. But the kid who like has to go to Taco Bell to hack the Wi Fi to like log in, like, this is the person who relies on school meals. Like, these are social issues that oh, they shouldn't fall on the schools, but they do. It's just like, we shouldn't have to be taking care of social determinants of health, yet we do because that's where it falls in this country. Yeah. Medicalize our social problems. So it, it, it's, it's really quite, quite difficult. Um, let's. Thank you, thank you for the American Academy of Pediatrics that spoke up on this sure, issue early. They sure did. Yeah. And they were right. Yeah. Right. They sure did. They were right. And they got a lot of crap. Yeah, because it was politicized. It was politicized. Yeah. Like, like, in those days, like, if you were talking about opening schools, you were like some kind of, like, storm the Capitol, like, you know, peace done. Yeah. yeah. You might as well put a MAGA hat on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was just, you know, people were, you know, they wanted to label every everybody. Yeah. And even, you know, as you and I have, I don't know about you, but. As I've spoken out, people sometimes try to size you up. Oh, wait a minute. See, you see one of them. See one of them. One of them. Tribal litmus test. test. Tribal yeah. litmus test. Like, well, Marty shows up on Fox News and says, open schools, he's therefore a fascist. Yeah. Or Marty showed up on CNBC and said, we should universally mask early in the pandemic. We'll save some lives. And he's a communist. You know? Right. It's crazy. And I, I, I have the same thing. But it's funny. that I might, like you, I kind of go with, well, where's the truth from an all-metal perspective? Like, politics be damned. And it's fun. I consider politics like a fun, happy phenomenon. But then this pandemic happens, and I'm like, oh, dear. This is now part of the problem. Like, this is really becoming an issue. I think we have more in common in this country than the echo chambers of the media will ever suggest. When there's a pothole in your community, it's not a red or blue issue. Right? It's a competence issue. And if you look at the real giant issues facing our country, okay, it's not the underuse of pronouns. It's not the culture war issues. It's corruption. 
which is alive and well, legal and illegal. Right? The legal is the paying off politicians by special interest. There's broad consensus in America around those issues, but we can't talk about it because we're being distracted by this game of polarizing us. Oh, Marty McCary, one of the cardinal signs of misinformation, <laughs> citing conspiracy and cherry-picking data and having fake experts and logical fallacies, and uh, you only engage in one of them, which was conspiracy thinking, which I think is true. It is a, it, it's, not, it's not intentional, it's a misdirection. Everyone's happy. The powers that be are happy to have happen because the minute everyone wakes up and goes, "Wait, wait, what?" Yeah. <laughs> this is not okay. And they are, they are, they're, they're waking up. I mean, I think we're all collectively having an awakening. I think the pandemic is going to help trigger. Hopefully, it helps us come together because, you know, this has been the shaming of people on all sides of this. It's so painful to watch. We've got to come together. You know, and if I have to read another Twitter handle that shames one way or the other. Like, either it's, like, First Amendment and boobs, or it's, uh, <laughs> or, or it's, you know, Eric, wear your dang mask, ding, or whoever it is. I don't know what it is. It's, like, you know, I, I, I just, it, uh, it's silly. The yeah. way to do Twitter is almost to post but not read it. Oh, I do that. Do you? Yeah. 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 Uh, although, the problem is every now and again I'll get a Twitter twitch and I'll be like, I wonder what's happening on Twitter. See, that's the game. It's the game. It's how sexy way. And it's like you scroll. It's like the lot. It's like the lottery machine. You just pull back on the on the arm and it. Oh, hater! Yeah, yeah. Now these twenty-six-year-old billionaires who you know live in this city in Silicon Valley here, who play us, you know, like we're some you know gamblers. They're the ones laughing. They are. They're laughing all the way to the Bitcoin. Vault, you know, it, it's it's it's. It, this, this, and I got to say this about the Bay Area, which is my home. Like, there's an elite here that are just the worst, most awful human beings wrapped in. We're helping humanity wake up and generate a sense of community through technology, yeah. and they're the most self-serving, ego-identified, uh, blind unconscious people that you could ever meet in your life. They speak a language that I hate. They care about things no one should care about. And instead of just giving us beautiful technology, they wrap it in an aura of religion almost, like yeah. a religion of tech and yeah. accomplishment and this and that. And then you have actual Bay Area residents who are the most wonderful, caring, joyous, heartful, loving people, regardless of whatever politics they have. And uh, that dichotomy, then publicly people are like, well, the Bay Area is full of crazy pronoun music. No, no, they're really lovely people. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen uh, the TV show Silicon Valley? Oh, God, have I? It hits too close to home. <laughs> it's like, it's amazing. It's like the Russ Hammond is this one. Oh, man. ROI, radio over the internet. <laughs> I, I have very modest goals for Personally, in terms of financial goals, I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to be a multi-billionaire. I'm just trying to get to 1B. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm worth $990 million. If you round down that zero, I'm I just like money. you. I have, I'm financially ruined. I'm ruined. $980 million. I had the, I had the car with the doors that went like this. Yeah, but you're still basically a billionaire, $980 million. No, I'm, I'm ruined. I'm like, you round down that zero. I'm just like you. Zero. I'm just like you. My doors, they don't go like this anymore. They go like this. <laughs> like, that's, not, that's not a real thing. Um, oh, man, I was going to say something about that. We were talking about Silicon Valley. I thought you were going to say something really complimentary as a build-up for a, for a hit. You just, you just went right for it. You were like, <laughs> There's no, I see, I do my hit first. I get it out of the way. Then I go with them. But you know, they're really nice people. So somebody told me the other day something like, oh, you know, you should meet this um, uh, this uh, pharma investor. I said, okay. And they were like, you know, I've worked, this is a friend of mine from grad school. He said, you know, I've worked with like over a thousand of them. And he's the only person that I really actually liked. I'm like, what, what does that say? What does that say? Mm. That's what that reminded me of what I was going to say. So there's this new thing, Clubhouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you get 30 invites. So it's, it's this very exclusive app. It's an audio-only kind of waste of time. Waste of time. <laughs> so you get in these little rooms and you chat with other douchebags who are thought leaders in the space of whatever, cryptocurrency or um, tech-enabled frontline healthcare wellness app. And they'll you have to be invited. 
And once you're invited, you feel very special because Dushi McGee had asked you to be on Clubhouse. So I said, oh, was, you know, very nice person that I knew asked me. She's a reporter. And I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. Let me look. I go in there. It was like SpongeBob. Twelve seconds later. It was like, fudge this. <laughs> yeah. This is total garbage. It's a bunch of people circle jerking each other about stupid shit that really gets me happy upset because this is where they think they're using their time wisely, sitting in a clubhouse group talking about, you know, um, uh, business motivational success. Like, you guys, it's a pyramid scheme. It's a scam. It's a scam. It's a scam. They're trying to make money off of you. Yes. By some venture folks are funding this to make you think it's cool to go there. I've never been on this, so I can't compliment it, but I am very happy with my own clubhouse called my subscription to the Z Pack. And as a supporter, that is one of the two things I support the Z Pack and the Peter uh, Peter Atia Drive membership. You're my special boy, Marty. You really, I mean, the five bucks is in the mail, son. Thank you for the pitch. Now, I thought about a couple times canceling and switching to Clubhouse, okay, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to play the race card. <laughs> Okay, it's because I'm off white, isn't it? You just won't you won't want to stay with me. It's not actually because you're off white. It's because you're off white and have no hair. But I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> you're a harassed, but you support Peter Atia. He's also off white and bald. <laughs> also, what the heck? Yeah, that's my criteria, dude. By the way, how cool is Peter? He's yeah. a mutual friend. <laughs> I went to his house. Oh man, I went to visit him. Oh man, and got, it's he's got like stuffed animals in his back, like full, not like you know. Not like, uh, you know, some purple monster, but like a moose, a moose, a deer, you know, and he does archery. He's like really good at archery. And he's got these, you know, these stuffed real animals for archery practice. That is not sane. He does the coolest things. You know? He's like, he's like the guy we all wish we could be. He actually does those things. It's like Rogan. Like Rogan's always like, oh, we just done, you know bat hunting in Guam, and then I came back and did some DMT, and then I got awoke, I saw the source code of the universe, and now I'm just smoking a blunt with, like, Chris Rock, and we're talking about comedy. Like, you know, it's, it's a guy thing. But, you know, you and Peter and Tia and some other folks are starting to replace the New England Journal of Medicine in their inability to communicate. And we sold, there's a role for peer review and for getting research published. But we can't be publishing articles six months after uh, something and we find the, the, the cure for breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So we need both, right? We need both. And the, the, the new way in which information is shared is awesome, and that's why everybody uses it. I, it's funny because I, I, get, I get approached by major organizations like Facebook or whoever to be part of their vaccination campaign. Would love you to be part of our vaccination campaign, and I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, so you want to ruin any chance of actually educating people about vaccines and having them believe that it's credible? Because that the credibility, I think, from our platform comes from the authenticity of you know, I'm not telling any party line. I'm telling you the best that I know right now. That's why I was a little ambivalent about kids' vaccines. You know, it's just like, well, risk benefit, risk benefit, risk very small, benefit also very small. Yeah. Um, but. I chose to vaccinate my child, and she also wanted to do that. So you can go through my process with me and understand that I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not in anyone's pocket. But the minute you start to look on to, like, oh, the New England Journal is doing a vaccine thing, well, now the credibility with the public is like, wait, what? Like, it's it just it does, it's not as authentic. That's why what Peter says, it comes from him. No one's paying him to say those things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Very powerful. And you, too. Like, who, whose pocket are you in? If anything, you're like always one click away from being fired from whatever you're doing because you say the truth. Yeah. Well, we you know, we definitely um, internally were fighting with Hopkins to because they were suing patients as we were exposing this on a national level on a much smaller scale. Right. But we were definitely internally pushing uh, uh, Hopkins to stop, and they did. And they did. And I don't think I'm going to be named the next dean of the university for doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, you got to stand up for what you believe in. I, I'm constantly reminded from my clinical work, that life is short. And you can be a company man, or you can speak your mind. And guess what? When you speak your mind, it feels great. Mm-hmm. It feels, authenticity feels good. It's ego syntonic instead of ego dystonic. Like, you're like, oh, this is me. This is me. This is me. By the way, so Ed from Brazil hit me with some uh, 
support all the way from Brazil. And he says, thanks for all the information on the pandemic. My country will get 200 million doses of Pfizer until November. So I'm finally hopeful. Yeah, I had written it before saying Brazil's a mess. We don't have a vaccine yet. We're really a mess. Terrible po- political leadership. Yeah, it just hasn't it. been good. It has not been good. And uh, Brandon uh, Busby says, uh, Dr. Z, you and Dave Smith, he's a comedian, 2024 presidential candidate, should do a crossover podcast. He was on Rogan during the Vax issue. That's interesting. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Maybe you should be a candidate. Could you, have you thought about running for something? I've thought about running from everything. <laughs> uh, that sounds like responsibility. Like, then talk about not being able to speak your mind. Although, you probably get elected for speaking your mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You just have no campaign fund. Because everybody who funds you be like, wait, you just told us we were pieces of crap. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being real, people. I'll take your money, but I'm going to call you what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's like, does that does it work that way? No. Well, that's why this never happens. <laughs> that's why people don't tell the truth. They're politicians. <laughs> Ask me all the time if, I, if, I, if I'd like to run, and they, they answer. Oh, you'd be great, dude. <laughs> <laughs> See, anyone who does that, anyone who goes, it would be the best president. Because um, they don't want it. There is one job I think I'm going to run for, and I'd like to announce it right now. Oh, gosh. County Comptroller. <laughs> Isn't that a great word? Comp- you never know. Is this P silent? I know. I love that <laughs> dilemma, right? You don't know whether or not to say the P or the you know. <laughs> You're like, if I pronounce it, am I, is it like the emperor's new clothes? Like, if I pronounce it, am I going to look stupid? Maybe I just won't pronounce it. How is it different from a controller? Right. A controller? Right. I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know either, but I want I want that. You want that job? Comptroller? That would be a freaking awesome pronoun. It's kind of dope. And you could put, like, a bunch of bumper stickers on your car, like, the Keurig Pump Troller 2022. <laughs> and just crush the game. You'd win, dude. And then you wouldn't know what to do. Um, would you be my campaign manager for County Pump Troller? I want to be Deputy Pump Troller. Because <laughs> we, all know, <laughs> we all know that that's a direct path to being Pump Troller, which is a direct path to retirement. Yes. I understand. Yes. They, uh, I think Elliot Spitzer ran for Comptroller oh, in New York. Yeah, remember all the sex scandals as yeah. governor of New York. And then he tries to make a rebound after he goes into hiding for a couple of years. Right, I remember that. And he goes on the Colbert show. Out of nowhere, out of the blue, he's coming out in his debut back in political life, <laughs> running for New York Comptroller. And Col- Colbert asks him, now what the heck is a Comptroller? <laughs> and he goes in this long description for five minutes while they actually control the pension funds and all this stuff. And then Colbert says at the end of that long description, well, given the magnitude of the job description, don't you think it should go to somebody with some degree of self-control? <laughs> it killed it. It killed his whole comeback. That one interview with wow. Colbert. That's amazing. That's See, that's a Colbert as a national treasure. <laughs> I mean, how is Cuomo still governor? I don't know, but um, his deputy uh, health secretary is very good, actually. She oh. just started the job. And she's doing a great job. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very politically expedient answer. I like it. Um, trolling compensation for the country. Cherie Thompson. Let's see here. we got some trolls. That's always good. Um, a comptroller is like CFO light boring, says Crispy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the opportunity that, to make comptroller exciting again. <laughs> make comptroller great again. Make, 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 it exciting. Again. make it less boring again. It could be that's, awesome. Oh, my gosh. Alarna. Uh, sorry. Um. Alarna Curry sent me like 31 bucks on YouTube and says, yeah, I know we got to shout that out. Alarna? I'm in big Alarna's bucket. <laughs> Alarna, Alarna Curry, she says, as an Aussie, no wonder she's already cool. I mean, think of what that is in Australian money, like $1,000. Oh, I mean, if think, I had that accent, man, uh, I'd get published in the New England Journal. No doubt. You would just call them up. You'd be like, listen, mate. What is second? African American on your board. That's right. One people. That's right. Yeah. There's too many white people in this. I'm gonna go in the outback. It's me and my boys. We're gonna rustle up some diversity. I don't know what kind of accent that was. Alarna says, um, it's no formal training. Alarna says, Z Dog is an Aussie. We figured out free universal health care and our public hospitals are as amazing as the private ones. So it's very easily doable. Why can't why can Australia figure it out, but not USA? Nixon really fucked you all. Well, let, I mean, let's be honest. It's a healthy population. I mean, it, to ask her if, if she can identify a single obese Australian. 
And if there is one, send send the picture in. Oh, listen, I've seen Crocodile Dundee 400 times. That guy was ripped. Back in the and he was like 60 or 70. And he was still like doing one arm push ups and like punching crocodiles in the face. Yeah. It's a real thing. Yeah. I mean, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, yeah. it took a manta tail to the heart to kill him. And you know that was an hour long struggle, bro. He, oh, he battled that <laughs> manta, right? <laughs> he battled that manta. I love, by the way, Marty and I have this running joke that, like, in the United States, we're so soft that we talk about battling conditions that really aren't, <laughs> they're really not important. Like, I've been battling a hangnail for the last month, and it's just been really difficult. Marty, what are you battling? I've been battling a black hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get a facial every two months, and they remove it. <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been my jaw here. Wow, that's a really, I hope. You know what? We're warriors together in chronic disease because I've been battling poison oak for the last five days. It's a, it's a one centimeter patch, and it's just. I found a Facebook group that. I've been, I, well, I know what you mean. I've been battling a 1.2 centimeter sebaceous cyst. That's asymptomatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, does, it does a disservice to people who like battle cancer. You know, it's like, no, that's a battle. That's a battle. But even even that language, I think, is the wrong language. Yeah, poor language. Poor language. Poor language. It's not healthy. Because what it does is also victim shames. So, like, you lost your battle with cancer. Yeah. It's like, well, how about cancer sucks? Yeah. Sometimes things happen. I was a good person. I had nothing to do with me getting cancer. Yeah. I did my best. And I'm at peace. And I've made. Uh, you know, had, my end of life was beautiful. And this, by the way, the, the ghost is talking about this in retrospect because we would never talk about these things during life because we're not conditioned to do it. We're conditioned to do the opposite, to deny and battle until we're gone. And then it's like, how did that leave the people who survived to, you know, with trauma? Yeah, and why would we define somebody as beautiful long life by a condition that emerged at the end of that life, right? Mm, great point. Yeah. You know, they, uh, like the tombstone just says, they, they lost the battle with the cancer. <laughs> they lost the battle with a sebaceous cyst. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't the sebaceous cyst that killed them. It was, they, they were driving, and they were feeling on it, and they got distracted, and they checked their phone to take a picture of it, and texted it to their telehealth doc, and they hit a pole. <laughs> <laughs> lost my battle with a sebaceous cyst. Um, man, I tell you, it, it, <laughs> uh, Oh, but t- Taylor Avery says, I can't wait to buy the new edition of The Price We Pay. It's out on paperback uh, June 8th. Please buy it so you can read it, so you can become a member of the Army that is battling something, battling for real, meaningful change in healthcare. Yeah, the battle against corporate medicine and the establishment in healthcare. We're on a mission to redesign healthcare, and we're doing it on, from the ground up, and it's going great. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I ruined your beautiful speech by fumbling with the wrong buttons. I think I almost killed the feed pushing a button um, while you were talking, and uh, now I pushed the wrong button again. You know what? I'm battling tennis. <laughs> <laughs> You're battling Facebook, canceling us remotely. <laughs> you know, it's, it's still funny. Like, half the people are still like, the audio is no good. I almost feel like Facebook is like, you know what? Let's roll the dice. Let's do the roulette meter. Half the people are going to send a distorted clip signal. The other half is going to be perfect. You know, neutrality. We need net neutrality. We need net neutrality. Yeah. Right, exactly. We need net no carbs. I don't know what that means. Um, let's wait into that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Did they mention the recent study that showed a lot of hospitalized uh, cases reported for children were cases where COVID was detected during universal screening but had nothing to do with COVID regenitarianism? I saw that. Did you see that? So they were saying, well, you know, actually more of these kids are admitted with COVID than of COVID. And I think that's probably true. I mean, I think, but the MISC thing is a real phenomenon. Um, uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, the Kawasaki-like syndrome. Um, you know, Paul's quite passionate about that. Paul's interesting because he has he has his own biases too. Like we all do. He's a pediatrician, so early in the pandemic, he was like, "Guys, like this is not that big a deal. Like, why are we closing schools? Why are we?" Because he knows that the harm to kids was there. Uh, yeah, a lot of pediatricians said that. Yeah, they did. They did actually. Pediatricians were the loudest voices of like, "Hey, what are we doing?" Because they know. They know. First of all, I'm not going to see this kid again. Like, this kid's going to be stuck in an abusive household. I'm not going to be able to touch it. They don't have good uh, education to be cared for. That's what kills me is that these these draconian blanket policies that we've done to shut kids out of their their 
communities. Let's be honest, that's what we've done. They've disproportionately affected poor kids and kids from minority communities. Shutting down the suburban school in Santa Barbara, California, is a lot different from shutting down the schools in inner city East Baltimore. Okay, and the idea that somehow you're going to give them an iPad and they're going to be cool even at age six, that's not how it works. And people don't understand that in Baltimore, half of the kids drop out of high school pre-COVID. Okay, now you do this kind of stuff, good luck trying to retain their interest in, in, in learning. Oh, man. I mean, it's heartbreaking. And thank you, Mary Lou, for all your support on uh, Facebook. She sent stars. And so, you know, it's, it's okay. One thing I will say about that before I take this question from Jeffrey Kowski. <sighs> it's so easy for people like us, right, in the position where we're in the Zoomocracy. Like, we make a living doing these horrible things on Zoom and having to sit in Microsoft Teams meetings and do all this garbage and, you know, and then be doctors and do all that. We can do it. We're part of the democracy. It's so easy for people like us to go, um, you need to stay home and mask up and stay out of school and hide. Yeah, we can pull that off. People who are essential workers, people who have kids living on the poverty level, and it's an abusive home. There's lots of stuff going on, cycle of violence, cycle of poverty. They don't have that option. This has been the most, and that's what Jay is about to try to some passion about. This has been such a disparity for, against poor people. Like, true progressives should be really, really upset by this. That's right. And yeah. most wealthy people during the pandemic have had it pretty good. Oh, hell yeah. They've retreated to their second homes. That's right. Most wealthy Americans have renovated their homes. Yes. I was in Florida where we've got some family. And you can't even renovate your home because there's no more supply and so lumber. Yeah. They, they can't even get the, some of the basic nails and lumber. And that's because everyone's renovating their homes, and they're not renovating them to make them smaller. <laughs> they're making these, they're creating these giant additions and remodeling their homes during COVID with sometimes their kids getting private tutors in the Hamptons. And then we say, oh, you know what? You know, even though COVID is way below seasonal flu levels in a similar case for Tellurian, let's just keep the schools closed anyway because we're almost done with the school year. You fell for it. Yeah. The American Federation of Teachers tried to stall until the end of the year when it was like, at this point, no point in reopening. And they're stalling over the summer. There's no summer classes. We're going to have a generation that's far behind. And, and, and the rich, poor schism gets bigger the more you screw with that. Like, the rich kids are already caught up. The poor kids are screwed. And, and, and this, then, then we wonder why there's even more inequity. Like, the pandemic generated this elite class of people that are just making tons of money remodeling their homes and all that. Yeah. And the contractors are making money, too. And then there's everybody else who's just, like, living on disability or living on unemployment and getting the $1,400 check from the government. It's crazy. The stock market has been crushing it yeah. in the pandemic, right? If you've had money, a good amount of money, tucked away in the stock market, you've done very well. If you're part of the half of Americans, 50% of Americans have less than $400 in savings on hand. On hand, yeah. And they live paycheck to paycheck. And for those Americans, it's been a very different pandemic. Super, super true. And you know, nobody really cares. I think the people who purport to care about the poor don't really care about the poor. Well, we just have to remember talking about diversity. It's not just race and gender diversity and economic, economic, diversity. economic diversity. All of us talking about these issues are in that upper 50%. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah, all yeah. in that. So we're talking about the other 50%. Yeah, the like paycheck, the room, paycheck, right? yeah. but they're not in the room. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, that's brilliant. You know, i got to say this. The only reason I'm not a complete asshole, <laughs> I'm just 90%. The only reason is that I went to public school in a rural part of California with normal people of all socioeconomic status and all race. And that, my best friends were, you know, people who, lower middle class or upper poverty. And that allowed me an understanding. Now, my parents were both doctors, but being Indian, they acted like we were impoverished, like one click away from being on the street. Like, I mean, eating Captain Crunch three meals a day. Of every plastic bag you've ever touched. There's a hoarding room in my, in my ancestral home in Clovis, California. You never talk money, so you don't know if you're bankrupting your family no clue. by buying a book. No clue, but Christmas was like, well, I don't know about that. I just want one Lego's action figure. Ah, uh, it's pretty pricey. It's uh, really expensive. You know, you can eat or you can have a present. 
I'm like, but we're just eating Captain Crunch three meals a day. But the captain is very nutritious. 14 herbs and spices and minerals. <laughs> now it's the same thing. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. But, but, but um, what's the book? We cannot afford it. We cannot afford it. Your parents are like, I'm going to be I'm scared. Like, did I just put us into bankruptcy because I paid too much for something? And I had no idea how much my parents made, right? I didn't ever want to talk to them ever. No, to this day, I have no idea what my parents made when I was young. I just know that we felt maybe middle class ish, yeah. bordering on poor. Yeah. And it didn't help that we lived in rural California. So it's like, well, you could, well, I mean, yeah. it's not like you go to the opera. There's no opera. Um, but so <laughs> I, I asked my dad last year oh. how much he made and how much he has. Yeah. It's, it was just burning at me for, yeah, so for years, for decades. Yeah. Your dad's like in his 80s, yeah. 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 So is mine, yeah. Yeah. And, and did he tell you? Yeah. Oh, it was like a bonding moment. Yes. Like, why is it secret? Like, what am I going to do? Like, raid the family safe? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you want to know now, or do you want to, you know, learn after and your parents pass you trying to, you know, figure out where the money is? So interesting. Yeah. It's funny because for very poor people, that's never a question. It's like, oh, I know exactly what my dad made. You know, unemployment or welfare or whatever, you know. Easy. I will say I was much lower than less than I thought I was. Yeah, that, you know what? I get the sense that that would be the case. Did you you anticipate? Oh, you know, the most. Well, and we also put today's standards on our on our parents too. Yeah, and they were investing in things like CDs with a two percent return. Two percent laddered, like but, laddered yeah. CDs. <laughs> That's the best. Well, you know, if you if you ladder it, some of them up, they mature at different times. Yeah, they cash out. You know, it's liquidity. Yeah, it's <laughs> a bogus annuity plan. Yeah, annuity, yeah. right? Whole life insurance. <laughs> Do not buy any of those products. I my dad. So my dad says one thing I learned: never buy whole insurance. It's a scam. <laughs> Just get some term insurance and invest your money. Yeah. I know, Dad. I read it on the internet. I guess I even take the word "whole" out. Yeah, yeah, just go insurance. All insurance. All insurance. All insurance. <laughs> That's pretty true. Yeah. Um, so I promised Jeff Kowski I'd answer his all caps message. Yeah. Doctor Z, how come there seems to be tons of side effects that people are getting from the vaccine, mainly tinnitus? Tinnitus. What are that are not being discussed, what say you? Okay, this is what I think. So I have heard these people saying, hey, I got tinnitus after the Pfizer vaccine. It's kind of like, okay, here's the thing. I don't know about you. If you pay attention to your ears right now, you can hear it. You can hear it. Yeah. And what does a vaccine do? It forces you to pay attention to your body. And what happens? You go, man, I have this ringing in my ears that I've always had that I'm just now noticing. Dang, you are a good doctor. Good. This is hurts Marty McCary, a placebologist. Things out. That's my new title. Z Dog MD placebo. What's your specialty? Well, I'm a placebo. I'll just I'm actually board certified in placebo, but I got a special certification. I was grandfathered in. You're slightly better than placebo. Slightly. <laughs> only slightly. The p value is unclear. Um, no, but I mean, that may be the case. And of course, you have to look at it too. You have to say, well, maybe it is, right? Maybe tinnitus is associated with the inflammatory response from the vaccine, but I don't think so. I think my intuition is that people pay attention to things like tinnitus that are uncovered by attention. In fact, one of the treatments for tinnitus is distraction. Mm-hmm. So you're either covering it up with other sounds. Yeah. Or, yeah, distract white noise. Yeah. White noise, yeah. I like brown noise just because I think white noise is racist. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, like the blue zones. Exactly. The brown zones. Exactly, exactly. The brown, the brown zones. zones. The brown zones. That's a brown, the brown zones are where people die. They die young. <laughs> 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 Oh, man. Marty, what's your heart out? When do we need to wrap up? It's 446 Pacific. Uh, I think it's something at, at 530 Pacific. Okay. So we might be able to, probably around 5 I should start because i got to get um, I gotta get the kids some dinner because my wife's working late tonight. You're a good man. I am. No, I'm a whipped man. I you, have to do my job. You are this funny, hilarious thought leader, and then you go home and you're a wonderful family man. And I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Oh, what a great. Listen, Marty. Uh, you are one of the few people that I actually believe is authentically, authentically you. Like, when I look at you, I go, that's Marty. Like, there's no, you you can't hide. What you see is what you get. That's right, WYSIWYG. Right. (laughs) But having a family is time. Like, people say, oh, where do you find time to write all this stuff? And I tell them, having a kid is like writing 20 books worth of time. And it's a good, it's a good investment. I'll say this, like, um, you either really want that or you don't. Or you're somewhere in between. And for me, I was very ambivalent about having kids. I was like, oh, I kind of like my me time. Like, I want to accomplish things in the world. I want to do these things. And it was about very me-centric. Then I had them, and I was like, you know what? I'm 
actually like, and it was when they're young, honestly. I was like, hey, any bit of work, they'll get me out of this house. I mean, smearing kids, changing diapers, smearing feces. They get a little older, and suddenly they're they're making you laugh authentically. Mm-hmm. Like, my kids make actually crack me up. Like, they'll make some offhand comment or joke, and I'm, like, laughing. And I'm like, okay, this is pure entertainment. Like, I've invested in an entertainment system with surround sound. Like, one of them's in front of me, one of them's behind me. <laughs> like, and, and I actually enjoy spending time with them. So this idea of, like, work, work-life balance is not that. It's like, how can I integrate life in one thing? And it's a challenge, but it's doable. So, if, you know, for young parents who are like, I don't know, I'm going to do this. It's like, you'll find, you'll find it. You just got to keep, look, don't settle for less than that. It's doable. That's cool. You know, it's amazing how many young folks I meet that don't want to do medicine full-time. They, they look at you. They look at Peter and Tia. They look at entrepreneurs. They look at people who think creatively. Mm-hmm. And they think, I want to learn medicine. I want to master it. I want to feel really comfortable. But I don't want it to be every aspect of my life. I don't want it to be a full-time, eight-to-five job. And, you know, it's maybe it's a part of our new society where people don't want to do the same thing every day. I personally love operating. I could I could do it every day until I die. But when these other opportunities open up to, you know, work in public policy and to write and do research, it's a nice uh, it's a nice mix. And young folks now are saying that half of the folks that do an MB, an MD MBA at Stanford don't have, have no intentions of practicing full time. I've I've heard this again and again, and I will say this like. <laughs> I think you find your path by going through life. Like, it's not just handed to you. You don't know what it is. Like, you and I, did we, did you or I ever think that we'd be doing what we're doing? No. No no, way. No, there's no. Not even conceivable. Word to describe our profession right now. Exactly. Because it's multifactorial. It's got all this stuff. And it's us. It's it's actually authentic to who we are. And when there's parts of it that don't feel authentic, you and I will commiserate and be like, oh, man, you know what I hate is this. Like, that's just the worst. Or, you know, I I really, this doesn't, I don't, I think I'm going to stop doing this. Yeah, me too. I'm going to stop doing this. Send us your slides in advance harassment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I see D nine code. Yeah, I see D ten. I see D ten now with epilepticus. With, <laughs> with and without template required. <laughs> Send us your slides in advance harassment. We, we, That's my one contribution to medicine. Is, is this is the harassment center of the code? Yeah. You know what? You, you and I should write a book called um, Thought Leadership for Dummies. <laughs> And uh, you get a little sidebar is like when they ask you to send your slides in advance, here's how you respond. Oh. You know, I like to keep it very fresh. Also, my computer's having problems. I will get you those slides, and then you never do. And then you just show up on a thumb drive, and you hand them. Oh, I'm not going to use slides. Oh, that's the best. Oh, oh. Oh, you know, remember I said I wasn't going to bring slides? I got them on a thumb drive here. Can you flip them up? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. We'll put them up. Why are most of these slides naked Jenny McCarthy? Well, I wanted to make a point, but we wanted to pre-approve. There's no pre-approve. We're on in five minutes. (laughs) It is, you know, there are certain things where sometimes, you know, and I feel like that's a little bit of our connection, but how many people relate to sending an article on a human rights topic that they feel passionate about to the New York Times? Six different um, articles get rejected in a row from the New York Times before the seventh one's accepted, right? These are experiences where you don't have any coaching or mentors. You don't know how it's done. You don't know who to send it to. What do you send it to? Yeah, right. And these are like the things where we can have a big impact. Well, this is why, like, when you and I got first got together a few years back at the AMGA meeting, we were both speaking, and yeah. we were like, oh, my God. Like, we, we, I think within five minutes, you took me to lunch at this crazy Chinese restaurant in D.C. that's like, you know, like, the bushes used to go there. Yeah. It's got, like, bulletproof glass. Oh, and you're telling me all these stories about politics and living in D.C. Yeah. But within, like, I think three minutes of our conversation, I was like, you know, do you ever have to do talks where they want your slides? And, slides <laughs> and they do this and that. And I go, okay, all right. Do we just become best friends? <laughs> do we just become best friends? Because there's no mentors for it. Exactly. And immediately we're commiserating. Well, like, so how do you set your pricing? And how do you deal with this? And how do you, you know, I, I'll never forget, like, I think it was a Tia, I don't, I don't know who it was, but I learned this from them. You can create an assistant for yourself just by creating another email account with a fake name, give it a backstory, and make it be your assistant. Interesting. And then that way you can be a jerk but via that assistant, with, but still be smart. Like, still know what to say. <laughs> We've both been battling conference organizers harassing us for slides in advance of the talk. It's a real life, life-changing battle. <laughs> it's a support group. Or, or they want to do three calls before the talk. Well, you know, we really want to get our board of directors on the call because we want you to understand who we are as a group. 
And I'm like, I read your website. And we saw your talk, but we just want to know, can you add the social determinants of health into your talk? <laughs> That's a minor issue. Yeah. I'll just put a slide that says SDH. <laughs> have you got this one? We showed your slides to our CEO, and we have some concerns. Oh, that's, oh, that's the, yes. I once I once went to a large healthcare organization, and I was going to do a song called Low, which was a parody of Flo Rida. Oh, yeah, Low. Yeah, I love yeah that. Low, you know. You know Should have got them apple bottom scrubs, Crocs with the fur, with the fur, the whole day billing Medicare. And it was me in a dreadlock wig <laughs> with T-Pain glasses on in a clinic with a bunch of twerking nurses and, like, Will you know, will intimate for food signs and like, you know, yeah. pay my loans for whatever. And it was a joke. And it was it always does really well at the shows. Well, they were like, can you add social determinants? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we're a little uncomfortable um, with the black face. And I was like, I'm sorry, the what face? They're like, it appears there's black face in this video. No, that's my real face. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that's true. That's my skin tone. It's, me. it's, it's me. not straight white. And I had a, a wig on, yes. But that's not black. <laughs> that's not black. That's, that's, that's being, me. been parodying the video. And, um, and I said, well, so is the concern there are black people in the audience that are going to be <laughs> just triggered by this? Because I understand. I mean, I would definitely be cognizant of that. I wouldn't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. And they said, oh, no, there isn't a single black person in our entire organization. It's just we don't want to trigger any white concern about blackface. And I'm like, this is the single biggest problem with America right now is butthurt by proxy. (laughs) I am outraged on behalf of my brown brothers and sisters. It's like, I don't need your outrage. I'm a grown boy. <laughs> we, we had a conversation about race, a bunch of buddies, and I was just kind of passively listening. I wasn't participating. We were just a casual conversation. And one, of, one of my friends says, you know, uh, I'm not racist. I have a very good friend who's black. And, <laughs> that's my favorite. Yeah, that's my favorite. And I find out later he's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you got upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a little talk. It's about just having a friend. <laughs> Who's black is, does not make you woke. Yeah. 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 Number next. Yeah. So then I pull out the world map, you know, show where my family's from. Here's Sudan. You should have started uulating, like, right there, you know. Oh, it is. No, 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 you can call Batul Gawande, he won't take your call. You can, you, can, you know, like, the, the people who are really big at this just have no generosity of spirit about it. I'm not picking on the tool just because I used to try to email him and he'd blow me off. And he still does. Um, and it just would never, you, who are you going to think? So you end up just gravitating in these circles. You know? Yeah. And then, but this is a point for everybody. Find mentors that do what you do or do what you're interested in. Yeah. And learn from them or commiserate with them or communalize your pain or laugh at them, whatever it takes to keep yourself from just bouncing off the wall. Gosh, I see our, you know, our residents and our students and interns get such bad advice so, so often. These are the most creative, altruistic people in our society. They're bright, they're energetic, they're ready to go. And as we beat the crab cycle into them and all this other road memorization regurgitation, we tell them, you really need to go into the laboratory for a year or two. So you can write a paper, even though research shows 99.9% of doctors will never use their laboratory research experience in their training in their career, the idea that, oh, it's just good to be aware Mm -hmm. of good research methodology so your brain can think in terms of a research format. No, no, if I want... To be aware of research, I'll watch a research awareness telephone. Yeah. Um, we're trying to raise awareness of research, and here's a picture of a starving researcher. <laughs> For pennies a day, you two can support, you know, I can't think of a good researcher name, like a good stereotypical. Hey, Boris. Boris? Boris. Oh, Boris, that's good. Boris. Boris is placebo. Boris is placebo. Boris. Um, let's see here. Uh, you, you, you should make a t-shirt that says, my pronouns are this, that. I like that, Josh. Yeah. yeah. Those are good pronouns. Yeah, those are good ones. I like them. Yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of <clears throat> this idea of like, oh, it's 
good to squander one or two years during your prime. Yeah. Just to be aware of something. It's like in med school when they would be, be, be sitting in the front row. Maybe not you, Andy, and say, say, do we need to know this for the test? <laughs> you probably just like to learn for the sake of learning. You know, I was always like, is this testable? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then every now and then the teacher would say, um, is it testable? I would say it's not going to be on the test, but it would be good just to be aware of it. Game over. Dog. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. dog out. <laughs> I've always spent that time memorizing the shit we need to regurgitate yeah. on your exam mm. so we can get through this game. Nailed it. By the way, Mary Lou is throwing so much money at me on Facebook. I just kind of love her so much. She's a supporter of the show. Um, the, the last question I think we should take is one that's come up a few times now, and you've written about this, and that is, you've, you, <laughs> there we go, damn camera. You've gotten COVID. Okay. Should you get one, both, or no doses of the vaccine, and why? Not both. Not both. One, or if you had a severe case, maybe not. And here's the reason why. We know that the antibody response is proportional to how sick you were from COVID. So if you had an asymptomatic case, you just tested positive, or had minimal or mild symptoms, I'd say get both. Mm -hmm. If you've had COVID, like the real deal COVID, one is the max I would recommend. It may be very likely that when you had COVID and you had a real COVID infection confirmed, not one of these other viruses that circulate, everyone says, oh, I think I had it. Yeah. It was confirmed, then your immunity is probably lifelong. That's what I believe. I believe it's probably lifelong. And let's stop shaming people that choose not to get the vaccine. Let's respect their decision. And I think it's reasonable if we believe in natural immunity, which is which is real. So the point is, like, we don't have to shame anyone, first of all, because we don't need them, we don't need them all to get vaccinated. That's right. Just, just if you get enough, and, and we're already there. Man, Marty, dude, brother, what a freaking – this is what I do this all the time. This is fun. This is so much fun. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's such a thrill. And uh, your book, let's pitch this book because we're going to do another show about the book closer to the day. But cool. this book, The Price We Pay, Marty McCary, I'll put a link in the description for the show on all the platforms. Get it on paperback, okay? It's available on hardcover now, and it has been. But this paperback version has a new updated afterword that's very powerful. It's very powerful in terms of what they've been able to do, what's been accomplished since the book came out because of the book and because of people like you who read it and said, you know what, we're not going to take this anymore. And if you get it on paperback, pre-order it even, it bumps it up on the New York Times bestseller list, which means a spotlight is shined on the most important thing right now, which is fixing health care so that when the next pandemic comes, we are not caught with our pants around our ankles again, <laughs> again. I told the publisher that the hardcover was like, they wanted to price it at like $30. And I told the publisher, of course, none of that money goes to me. Right, right, right. It, it's, it's all this to the publisher. Yeah. Right. But they, um, and I said, we can't have a book that includes a section on price gouge <laughs> and price gouge them on the book. <laughs> so one of the reasons I'm so excited about this second edition, which is the paperback, is that it's a lot less expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love it, dude. I love it. Marty. Great to see you, brother. It's a brother. Yeah, you're, you're a brother from no mother at all. Look at this. Love it. Did we even just do a thing? I think we did. Let, let's thank everybody here. So the YouTube guys were just crushing the game. They, they, um, Sent all kinds of support, like skirt wearing haggis eater. <laughs> sent five bucks Canadian, which is like a 37.6 cents. S American. Skirt, I don't know if we can accept skirt, skirt wearing return. haggis eater. No. Yeah, so it's a, it's a Scott. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I got an anti That's an, okay. Yeah, an anti vax girlfriend leaving me for being vaccinated for fear of me shedding and infecting her. Is that even possible? Watch the beginning of this skirt uh, wearing haggis eater. Thanks for your support. Thanks to everyone who sent stars on Facebook. Thanks to our supporter tribe. If you join ZDogMD.com forward slash supporters, I will love you forever because you'll be with me on the almost every other night that we do a live show. And if you want to just give a tip in the tip jar, paypal.me forward slash ZDogMD, I will respond personally by email and yell at you for being so awesome. All right, guys. Now, this is the awkward part, Marty. I have to kill the feed on YouTube, which I'm going to do right now. Bye-bye, YouTube people. But then the awkward